Thank you for listening to Marketing Today with me, Alan Hart. In recent months, we've gained a lot of new listeners, and I hope you'll continue to tell your friends and colleagues about the show. This week, we're going to Into the Vault and re-releasing my interview with Stephen Handmaker, the CMO of Assurance. Stephen's a dear friend, and his thoughts on culture, technology, and talent are timeless. Get ready to rock out to a rock star of marketing. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I have Stephen Handmaker, Chief Marketing Officer of Assurance, one of the largest independent insurance brokerages in the United States. He's responsible for a company's marketing, communications, branding, and digital media as their Chief Marketing Officer. Recently, he won the CMO Leadership Award, which recognizes demonstrated leadership in building, leading, and motivating a high-performance marketing organization. Over the past five years, Assurance has won over 60 national and local awards as being a top workplace. Well, welcome to the Avid Podcast, Stephen. Thank you for having me. You've been awarded a number of awards, or Assurance overall, for workplace and the workplace environment. Why should a CMO care about the company culture? Well, I think a CMO cares about performance like any officer of the company should care about culture because it, it, it is about, you know, uh, engaged employees. And a lot of times when we win those awards and they talk about our culture, what they're really measuring is the engagement levels of our employees. And I think if you, if you believe most of the reports that are out there, you know, they look at business overall in this country and, and only about a third of those businesses would score out having any level of engagement among their employees. So that means two thirds of the companies that are out there have unengaged workforces. And that's not a good thing. Um, we believe strongly that engaged employees um, make a difference and are, are better. So, uh, so we try pretty hard at that, you know, whereas I think the workplace average in the country is about 34% of employees are engaged. Assurance regularly scores out around a 98%. And, uh, and that means uh, our employees have real investment in the company. So engagement isn't really just happy. Engagement is more along the lines of they know what we do. Uh, they they want to help the company get better. They're willing to go the extra mile. They know the products and services that we offer. They know how their role helps the company succeed. And as a CMO, where it gets me excited is that when we drive that kind of behavior and that kind of culture within our company, you know, uh, I'm in a service business, and and like most companies, our our people are our brand ambassadors uh, up and down the organization. And you certainly want those brand ambassadors engaged and understanding of, uh, of how you as an organization win. How are you driving that engagement at Assurance? Uh, as a marketing group, I'm, I'm really fortunate. So we're a mid-sized company. I'm, I'm going to use mid-sized, big to some, small to others, but you know, but we have a little more than 400 employees. And one of the, uh, one of the things at Assurance that makes us different or unique or what have you is that all communications funnels under marketing here within our organization. And we, we, uh, that's internal communications, external communications. So it's really, when we think marketing, it's both marketing and communications here. And what that allows us to do is it really allows us to control our message, uh, internally as well as externally. And, and you might argue that we, we spend more time communicating and marketing to our employees as much as we do externally. So I like to think of what we do as flavoring our communications in a way that really helps pick culture up. So we, we do have a certain vibe here, and that is a bit of a modern pop culture, rock star oriented vibe, which I suppose isn't normal for insurance, but <laughs> that's how we do it. And, and we, we behave that way, we look that way, we flavor that way, we message that way. You know, it's just an energetic thing that happens here. And so whether it's how we communicate, videos that we create for our employees, 
the images that they see on our intranet, on our walls, the wild events that we throw, the fun that we have. Marketing has a pretty strong hand in making sure all of that matches up with the image and the culture that, that we believe is relevant here. And, uh, and then our people, naturally, they bring the energy to it. So It sounds like a fantastic culture. And I know you also are almost a rock star yourself, but we, well. won't, go, we won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there. Today. In my head. In my head, maybe. But yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so is it is it any different for your marketing organization versus the organization overall in terms of driving that engagement and culture? Uh, it, it amps up the, the expectation for sure. The marketing team is asked to do a lot uh, because I need them with, you know, with one eye in, in the house and one eye out of the house. And, uh, and that, that, that takes a different skill set, I think, than most typical marketing organizations where I really want them focused on the external. So here it, it requires sort of two hats uh, on any given day, and it's up and down the team. But I think the one thing that is true is that, you know, we're, we're asked to be more than technical and we're asked to be more than creative. Um, I need and require of my team to bring that energy regularly. People do look to us to, to sort of take some of their cues for, for how to, you know, how to let this culture bleed through. And so I need it top to bottom. And luckily I've got amazing people who, who, uh, who seem to get as energized by this stuff as I do. And, and that makes it a lot easier. So it's switching gears. What's the, what's the state of B2B marketing today? Well, it's probably getting closer to B2C every, every single minute, and that's a bit how we approach it. I think uh, B2B marketing, certainly in our space, and we're, uh, we're an insurance brokerage, so you know, we deal in financial services, I suppose. And the way we look at it is you know, we're, we're very bought into the idea of the buyer's journey. And, and we know that when it comes to the sale that we make, you know, there's a few very specific audiences that we're, we're speaking to, and that's, you know, CEOs and CFOs and sometimes heads of HR. Uh, some companies have their own dedicated insurance risk managers, what have you. And so we have a few very specific audiences who go on their own buyer's journey. And so as, as that's become more of a thing, rather than focus on the funnel, we're focused on the journey. And, and it's proven to be really meaningful to us. And I think that, you know, where B2B is becoming extremely content heavy, I think that's important, but I do think timing matters. So um, the buyer's journey really helps us take our content marketing efforts and marry that with, with the right time, you know, not just right people, but right time that they need to receive a message for maximum impact. So I would say, you know, B2B marketing in many ways is, yes, it's one company speaking to another company, but, but we never can forget that there's still an individual inside that company who's making their own decisions for their own reasons. And, you know, and in my world, that's, you know, that's not too different than consumer. So, you know, they might have a few different, they might have a few different uh, elements to consider as they make a purchase. You know, it's not their, just them or their family. It's they need to consider the company behind them and the boss who's who might be thinking about the choice they made or the board, what have you. And uh, but it's all relatively the same. And, and certainly access is is much easier now. So, is there an example maybe you could give me on um, an element of the journey that you've focused in on or you've you've worked to try to improve? Right. Well, you know, here, um, you know, we're an industry big with case studies. People mm -hmm. love case studies, love case studies. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and it's understandable. You know, you want, you want, uh, you know, we're proud to show examples of how we've helped, let's say, a certain kind of company overcome a certain kind of objective, you know, and, and understand that there's other similar companies who are going to recognize themselves in that and want to have that same experience. So case studies work all the way around. Well, Unfortunately, what we were discovering as a group is that we were producing these great case studies and we were making them meaningful. And what we came to discover is that we were trying to present these case studies to a buyer at the completely wrong step of their journey. You know, in other words, 
They didn't want to see the case study right at the early on consideration phase of, hey, I just need to start to engage somebody. Um, then there's the you know, the middle phase of getting to know them, and we're also trying to jam a case study down their throat. That's not when they want to receive that information or are open to getting it. But there is a time when that case study throughout the journey becomes much more receptible and meaningful and makes a bigger impact. And that is... Uh, very much when we have found that, ah, now is when that has major impact. So why are we bothering trying to push this case study at them, you know, throughout their buying cycle when it's completely irrelevant? It would be much more meaningful if we present it at the right time. So thinking about the timing of matching our communications to the buyer's interest has proven very telling for us. Interesting. So how does technology play a role in those marketing efforts? Huge. <laughs> Huge here. Uh, so we're all bought in. I'll admit, I'm, I'm all bought in on technology and uh, and have been for some time and, and easing this process and, and making this more meaningful. So it's not just CRM, though certainly CRM is something that we utilize as an organization. Uh, but I, I more look at CRM as being the central hub with which I fill my marketing intelligence. And, and for some time we have been uh, users of the Eloqua system, which has now been purchased by Oracle. So we're big Eloqua users and the intelligence that Eloqua gives us on our audience uh, and all things digital. And, and then we feed that back into CRM so that our salespeople and other account executives can have access to, to reviewing that information and getting to know their audience uh, even more deeply and the things that are of interest to them. So so we use technology very much to track a journey and to make sure we're aware of what people are interested in throughout that journey. So so now we're, we're using other elements of the Oracle Marketing Cloud to help that. We use a video distribution system now. We're getting ready to employ Oracle's uh, social uh, media element to it as well and that is just going to further amp up the intelligence that we're going to have on our buying audience and and just to help us serve them better it's not just to make the sale but but why bother trying to serve them in a way that maybe they don't have an interest in right now we we want to look for cues and look for interests and try and respond accordingly so we think that's a very powerful thing to do and it's available and for some reason it seems relatively inexpensive, the bang for the buck of what you truly get for it. Certainly, we're using a state-of-the-art system. There are other systems similarly that are inexpensive. But but the days of just guessing what people want to hear about and then blasting out messages is, I think, a thing of the past in much the same way that you know, my first job had me sending out 30,000 postcards <laughs> praying, you know, praying that, you know, that somebody would call the 800 number on the back. So... So admittedly, I've been at this for a while and I've seen things you know, move forward and, and I remember email marketing seemed like the greatest thing in the world when it first came about. But even that doesn't necessarily provide you the intelligence that you need in order to make good decisions and do things at the right time and make sure you're responding to people's interests. All that information is out there. It's just a matter of seizing on it. So that's the path we're going down. We think that matches up well with with B2B and with the world that we're we're focused on. It's not easy. It's new technology. It's new not just for the marketing group. It's new for the salespeople. And it's it's a lot to digest. But we're focused on making it work. We we know that we know that the world isn't spinning backwards. How's that? So we're <laughs> it sounds like technology, you found a way to make it work for you. A lot of CMOs yeah. I talk to are kind of baffled by it. Or they're trying to figure out how to stitch different systems together. Any tips or thoughts about you know how um, how you've approached it or, or things lessons you've learned that you can pass yeah. on? Yeah, thanks. That's that's a good question. Uh, and I would tell you that you know we we have made it work for us, but again, we're still learning. But I would I would step back and say so we we now use a pretty great system. I, I think you know Eloqua and there's a few others that are out there like this, whether it be Marketo or or what have you, are, are kind of state of the art for what they do. Um, but we limped into this with a very inexpensive system to start to let us look at intelligence. And we spent about a year and a half using that system. And for the most part, the first year, we didn't even share the intelligence with our sales staff. We were, as a marketing group, just pouring over the 
unbelievable amounts of data we couldn't believe were available to us in a, and not just data in a mass. The, the thing about this, these systems are they're data focused on individuals. So we spent real time very inexpensively, and there's still a lot of very inexpensive systems out there. I think it was at the time it was like 500 bucks a month or something like that. And wow. it, it really let us look at, hey, John Smith, um, all of your digital interactions with them, you know, 80% went ignored. But of the 20% that they didn't ignore, here's exactly what he was doing and what he was interested in. And we were trying to figure what conclusions we can draw by those things. Um, and then once you engage John Smith, you realize that, boy, you can have a much better conversation just understanding a bit more about what his interests are as opposed to guessing. So so we, we limped in, and, and I think that that'd be my biggest suggestion is don't you don't need to spend a fortune in order to get comfortable looking at this and figuring out how that could work for your organization. So that's a great that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Great suggestion. Um, so with all this technology, um, as well as the two hats that your marketing organization has to wear in terms of internally driving the culture and external market facing activity, you know, what does that mean for the marketing talent that you need inside your organization? Mm, it's uh, it's challenge. It's not easy, particularly the technology part. Um, creative just doesn't cut it anymore. You know, we used to say, "Oh, marketing's filled with all the good creatives and and researchers or what have you," and and that's all still true. But uh, but you do need people who are comfortable with technology now. Um, I know I was. Uh, recently, I, I was hiring for a writer to come in and be a Marcom person, a, a project person. And the person stepped in from college, a great, smart, young person who told me that, you know, they're anti-social media. And I, I remember thinking, wow, well, congratulations, I'm done. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because, you know, that might be a great personal stance for you, but that's that's not the reality of what's happening in the world today, particularly from a marketing standpoint. And I, I don't have time for that. So I need somebody comfortable with technology. And, and that is, uh, that's a challenge, particularly all this great new stuff that's out there, meaning, you know, all these systems, they're still new. So it's not like there's an endless supply of, of people out there who have years of experience working on them. So to some extent, we have to rely on the ability of us to work with these folks as well as our vendor partners and know that they can be trained up on the technology rather quickly. So you need that technical bent if you're going to be a user of it. And, um, and comfort with technology is incredibly important for us. So how do you, how do you find these folks? Um, well, a little bit of every which way, and I suppose that doesn't make us unique. You know, the, there are two things that, that might make us unique. One is that uh, we are big on employee referrals here as an organization. We have made our living growing by employee referrals. One of the one of the benefits of being considered a great place to work when you get on all those rankings, be it Fortune magazine or whatever, is that you know your employees, your engaged employees that I spoke about earlier, are incredibly proud to um, to talk about the organization and to refer every friend and family member they know to come work here at what a great place this is. So finding talent is something we've done often through employee referrals, and that is one way we we get great names coming to us. Another way is that when you're on every best place to work list in the country, you get a lot of resumes. And we do, and that's for sure. But when it comes to this very specialized technology, in some ways, you still have to seek it out. And you have to look for vendors, and you have to know how to uh, leverage social media to call out very specific interests. Um, so I would say there's not one right way, uh, but we employ a lot of ways. Um, finding them and identifying possible candidates is something we do. Vetting them is the hard part. Mm -hmm. Vetting them is something as an organization we, we're not an easy place to break into and uh, the good or bad, it's just kind of the way it is here. And what we do is we do have a pretty rigorous interview process and, and a selection process. We're looking for talent, but at the same time, we can't forget culture and the importance of culture here at our organization. So we hire a great deal for culture fit in as much as we do for talent fit. We'd, we probably lean towards the idea that we'd rather, we'd rather have an open position for a longer period of time if it means we haven't yet found the person who combines both the skill set 
and the culture that we we need to maintain our organization. So, so talent's the never ending challenge, and and it is a big part of my job as a CMO is to constantly be out there trying to look for and identify talent. So I do have a bit of a a pipeline, if you will. I'm always looking, and I suppose if you're a another business leader and I'm getting to know you and the people in your organization, you can probably be sure that I'm looking for somebody to steal. I unabash, unabashedly, uh, uh, talent wins. I get that. And, uh, and I always am keeping a little stockpile of, of names of people I'm interested in, in my back pocket. So I love that. I love, I love your, you're looking to steal people from other organizations. Hey, blatantly honest. What can I tell you? I love it. I love it. So I'm, I'm, I think I've heard you talk about this in the past when we had a prior conversation, but I'm going to ask and, and see if you want to talk about it. I, I, so I'm a psychology undergrad and I, I love the use of behavioral profiles, sometimes personality, but a, a more interested in kind of behavioral profile tools. Do you use anything like that in the vetting process or the screening process? Uh, we do. Uh, we do. And uh, we, we're big believers in, um, in psychoanalyzing everybody. I'm always amazed <laughs> that, uh, uh, so we, we have a standard, um, group. Uh, it's, it's an Omnia profile is the one that we use. There's all kinds of others, uh, that, that really look for, and it's predictive. It's not meant to be, Hey, this means you're bad or good, a bad or good person. It's just meant to say, Hey, for this particular role, which we have scored and focused and, and set behaviors of what we think would equal success. How do you match up to that? And so we take these uh, uh, Omnia profiles and we basically give them to everybody applying for a job. And then we match them up to the, the job that we've already set forward and we take a look at what happens. We want to bring people in who are going to succeed. And the amazing thing is, is this thing through a pretty simple you know, hey, answer 50 questions and you can't believe how right it is. It, it amazes me to no end um, how just some basic, simple, honest answers can can be so true on measuring the likelihood of success. Uh, there have been times over the years where we have tried to beat the system, meaning we come across an amazing candidate that we think, oh, they can't be bad. They're, they're for sure going to kill it here. And then they take our Omnia profile and profile says, nah, I don't think so. And we say, you know what? We know better. So we bring them on board. And sure enough, six months later, I'm like, I can't believe <laughs> that didn't work out. And, and the stupid Omnia profile, everything they said about the likelihood of this outcome winds up being exactly true. It is amazing to me that you really can know. Um, so we'd rather make that smart investment in time and up, up front because we want it to be the right experience for our candidates as well as for us. So it's a, uh, it winds up being a smart to do. Maybe it's a bad joke, but you're in the risk business and you're taking the risk out of hiring, right? So that, Hey, that we're in the risk business where that's our mission is to take the risk out of everything. You know, it's, <laughs> uh, you know that you can't make risk go away entirely, but you can minimize it. So that's uh that's what we do. That's awesome. That's awesome. So this is the last question, but I enjoy this question the most. Um, you got to get your crystal ball out, um, and what I want you to know, what I want to know, is what do you predict for marketing's future? Ooh, the future of marketing. Well, I, here's what I'll tell you. I think the future holds, and then I'll tell you what the future holds that is exactly true today. So, I think the one thing the future holds more so, um, more so than ever before, is personalization. I really do think that the ability to really understand all the things there is to know about behavior driven emotions and and habits that every individual has is freaky and is scary and and all that good stuff but it's out there and i really do think that a company's a business's ability to reach its audience in a extremely personal way is what's available to to all those willing to take advantage of it, and I think we'll see more and more and more of that go forward. So, um, I think uh, I think unfortunately the world in which we live, the technology that's available, the the amount of information about us as individuals that's out there on social media and and other channels makes it very very real to get very personal with somebody. And as you know, often getting personal can really help make a difference. So I believe personalization is something marketing will, will dive deeper and deeper and deeper into probably until it scares us all to death. So I think that's part of the future. 
Um, but what I think is part of the future also that is just true today, and I don't think this is changing, is that is that there's always going to be room for a great simple story. And sometimes, despite all this technology that we've talked about, sometimes just having a great story to tell and having it be simple and easy to understand, that's true today, and I don't think that's ever going to go away. So all the technology in the world and all the personalization that I'm describing is going to help, but at the end of the day, it comes back to a great experience, a great story, and the ability to get somebody to hear that and have that be meaningful to them. So um, so I think for as much as going to change, there's going to be plenty that, that doesn't ever go away. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. It was my pleasure. Good, good talk. Good fun. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at Atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with project management by Sarah Williams, audio production by Aaron Campbell, writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. We love to hear from listeners at info at atomic, A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.